Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Real View podcast for today's episode. I'm your host, Allison Wiley. With me today, we have one of our favorite guests, um, not a new guest on the Real View podcast, but certainly one that we love having on every chance we get uh, to talk to her. Beth Wanless, the Director of Government Affairs at Ohio Realtors. Welcome back, Beth. Hey, thank you so much, Allison. Yeah, we're super happy to have you on again. We have a jam-packed episode, lots to cover here. This is all going to be about the Ohio operating budget that was just passed at the end of June, $75 billion, a lot lot of money, um, a lot to cover there. The operating budget, House Bill 110, was introduced earlier this year and has a lot of realtor issues and things that our members that Ohio realtors care about. And we're going to dive all into that. So Beth, why don't you kind of kick us off here? What do our members uh, need to know about this huge state operating budget that will carry us for the next couple of years? Yeah, thanks so much for that great intro. And you are right. The operating budget is huge. It's over 30, I think 3,600 pages. I admit that I did not read word for word, but I did search about, I don't know, 75 key terms. And I did read a lot of the, the comp docs. That's what they call it, comp doc, a comparative document that sort of compares, you know, one version to the other version, and it's 999 pages or something. But yeah, the budget did pass. It was signed right before the deadline on July 1st, so just a few days ago. It started off early in the year where the governor works with the agencies and the administration to get their priorities and their budget priorities and their needs in line. And then, you know, he sends that over to the House The House then creates the first draft and they may or may not take some of the governor's priorities and create that. I think it was like a 2000 page bill. So my gosh, I know know. it's it's always a little scary because we did advocate for a couple of things in it, you know, right off the bat. And you just don't know. It's sort of like an evil Christmas morning because you're like (laughs) waiting for the bill to drop and you're like, oh, it could be awesome or it could be like horrible. But Actually, we're very, very pleased with how it turned out. Very pleasantly surprised. We're really grateful to the legislature for listening to our needs and our concerns and and our wants. So I can hit off on whatever you want me to talk about. There's a lot to get through. So I'll, I'll kind of let you guide the conversation. Sure. So we have really have no idea about what goes out until it actually comes out. So there is that like period of anticipation where we're just kind of sitting around waiting and wondering what is going, (laughs) what is going to end up coming out. That has to be like definitely a moment of anxiety and (laughs) panic and stress a little bit. Yeah, it is. And we're really trying to, you know, we try to be proactive. We started conversations with the governor and the lieutenant governor, you know, way back last year to talk about a few of our priorities. And then, of course, things change so quickly. So what our priorities were in October of 2020 changed for February of 2021, but not that much, at least. So you're right. It's you really have to get out there and talk to people and tell them like what your deal breakers are, what's really important and keep advocating. You know, you really just can't stop. You can't. Although I say it's like Christmas morning because we want to see what's in it. Like we did so much work on the front end of it to try to you know, get our priorities out there and make sure that everyone from the governor to the policy staff knew what was important to us. So we did have one really good victory. We had several good victories, but one that we were really aiming for, and that is the issues that our members faced, not only during COVID, but generally before COVID. And of course, during the slower end of COVID, but it's dealing with all the real estate licensing functions. So a lot of our functions must be done using a paper-based system. It's an antiquated system. It's I know people like to place blame. Oh, it's this person's fault. It's this person's fault. There's no blame to be placed. It's just one of those things that you know the system has been tolerated by our members for decades, and there really hasn't been this, I guess, emergency need to upgrade this system, this paper-based system. 
until COVID hit. And then we found a lot of our brokers when they were trying to transfer licenses and they couldn't go into the Rife Center to do that. And they, they wanted something that so many of the states surrounding us have, which is an online system where you just press a couple buttons, you, know, you pay with your credit card and bam, it's done. COVID really shined a light on those inadequacies. So with that said, we, we were talking to the Division of Real Estate and Superintendent Ann Pettit, and she was very empathetic and understanding of our needs. She did talk to the Department of Commerce and Director Maxfield about, we have many needs, but really the most pressing need is getting that license transfer moved to an online platform. So there was funding in the Department of Commerce's funding request, about $1.6 million that would move license transfers to an online system. And we, we just advocated, you know, we want the Department of Commerce to have that full funding request approved. That's really important to them. There is another problem with some licensing issues, and that's dealing with liquor permitting. I mean, I think also something that was very popular over yeah. COVID was <laughs> drowning your stress with like a nice glass of wine. And so, yeah. you know, liquor permitting was a really hot topic. So we're kind of right in line with the liquor permitting issues, but that funding was approved. And we're very, very grateful to not only the Department of Commerce and the Division of Real Estate, but the legislature uh, for approving all of their funding needs. So that was great. Yeah, no, that's something that I know our members are going to be so excited to hear about and something that we've been aware of and we know that it's been an issue uh, for a while now. So that's really exciting. Can't wait until it actually will be implemented and, and um, our members and new new realtors can start taking advantage of it. That's going to be exciting. It's kind of crazy to think that we are halfway through 2021 now and that it has never moved to an online system I before. Know. <laughs> I I really, I, I'll be honest, I didn't understand how behind the times we were until we were asked to testify. Well, I mean, we, we heard about this from our brokers and our members, of course, over the course of the last year and a half. But I personally really started digging into this issue. We were asked to testify in support of a bill that would modernize a lot of the state's technological needs. And I went in there and I just said, you know, we have more real estate licensees than all of the contiguous states. And we are the only state in the Midwest who has no online licensing system. So, wow. you know, our members account for 15%. Like the work they do is 15% of the economy and we're wow. still sending in checks. And I even cracked a joke, you know, it's never... It's a little scary to crack a joke when you're giving testimony in committee because <laughs> you just never know what the audience is going to do. Right. But I did say, I was like, I mean, can people under the age of 25 even write a check? And of right. course, the vice chair is a young, a young man. And he was like, I can write a check. And he's actually sitting for his real estate license in a couple of weeks. So there was a lot of sympathy from that committee regarding our needs and the needs of our 36,000 plus members to get those systems moved online. So we don't need to have people drive to Columbus to transfer licenses. So yeah, no, no, not good. Definitely yeah. much needed upgrade. Very, very exciting stuff. Thank you for your important work on that. We're thrilled, thrilled that that was able to to get through and hopefully it will be implemented soon. I know we're not sure exactly when it will um, begin this online system, um, but hopefully soon we can be brought <laughs> into 2021 and into um, this virtual world that we all are so comfortable living in now. Yes. So another, another big issue and something that we've really... Uh, campaigned for is the broadband internet expansion. I know this was, this has been a crazy one. So break it down for us. What, what was that all about? I know it had a lot of changes that it went through. You know, Ohio Realtors was very supportive of it and something that we've kept our eye on for a while. So break that down for us. Yeah, it was truly a roller coaster. And I know I, I alluded to that in an article I wrote, but the governor and his budget requests, he proposed a $250 million fund to expand the residential broadband program across Ohio. And it's funny. Well, it's not funny. It's actually really sad. But a lot of people think that broadband, um, you know, is only it, it, it's only lacking in these small rural communities or wherever it's Broadband is missing in so many parts of the state. It's truly shocking. I know we have a lot of members who don't have access to good broadband. 
And we have brokers who run pretty successful businesses that have, you know, don't have broadband. It's truly remarkable. So the House did take into consideration some of the governor's budget requests. They approved $190 million for the residential broadband grant program that was passed in House Bill 2. So the, the framework for the grant program was already passed with some funding in it a few months back, and that was Representative Carfagna's bill and Representative Stewart. That was done a few months prior. So really, this money is just getting the funding in there to continue to expand broadband access. The House passed the $190 million, and then the Senate removed all the funding for broadband expansion, much to the surprise of a lot of us who were pretty actively advocating for broadband funds. So we did testify that we wanted more funding in that broadband program. And I know there were a lot of other groups who testified similarly. I think it was a political move. I don't think there was ever true intent to remove all funding. And that's the nature of the budget. The House and Senate kind of horse trade, if you will, to see who can get what. And unfortunately, we all got a little scared. <laughs> so yeah. we, you know, we we tried to articulate our support for that funding as much as possible. And I do well, there's an article from two years ago in the Journal of Applied Economics that says that a single family home that has broadband access is three percent more valuable than a home with slower or no connections. So if COVID taught us anything, it's that a strong broadband and internet is just incredibly important to not only our members and their businesses, but the values of properties and homes. And then, of course, maybe arguably the most important need of our students who needed to study at home. So it's a really big win. And we're so grateful for that $250 million funding approval. Yeah, that's going to be huge and change the lives of a lot of people. And that's kind of what I was going to ask. We know that COVID kind of spotlighted some of the changes that needed to be made with the licensing system. And now kind of we're seeing a similar theme with the broadband that COVID really spotlighted this issue and kind of brought it to light for maybe the first time, you know, brought it to light when it maybe would have stayed in the dark. Is that kind of a similar theme that you've seen like throughout the entire budget that ended up coming out or kind of are we just seeing, you know, a couple instances of it uh, with these two examples? No, for sure. It's it's remarkable. I mean, we're we're seeing a lot of different programs that may or may not be related to our industry, but they're having to make these big changes. I mean, even alcohol consumption, they're changing the way that works, you know, and they've approved some changes there. And I argue it makes us like cooler in some ways that we can compete with the bigger states. It's just it's amazing how COVID has changed so much. Uh, yeah. what we do and how we live our lives and what's important to us. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. And that it's going to continue to change, I mean. We are starting to get back to normal in, in most senses here, but we're still fe feeling the effects of it being you know, a couple months removed out of it. I can't even imagine how this is going to impact us you know, even more so moving forward. It's going to be really crazy to think and, and even just to think back and, and reflect on the past year and say, wow, all of this really happened. Now we're kind of seeing the after effects and how it's going to change our entire world moving forward. And it's going to change it in probably ways that we're not even thinking about. For um, sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely um, interesting theme and um, crazy how one thing can change our whole, our whole world. But that is definitely crazy, yeah. something that has happened. And then I know another big part of the budget is the fair housing and discriminatory covenants. And we were lucky to have Jim Obergefell, who was the plaintiff in the Supreme Court case that legalized same-sex marriage throughout uh, the United States on our podcast a couple of episodes ago. And one of the things he mentioned was, yes, we have this, you know, same-sex marriage is now legal, huge win, but 
there is still issues and some things are still not equal for individuals of the LGBTQ community. So this kind of addresses that a little bit. So tell us about what came out of this Fair Housing and Discriminatory Covenant. Yeah, this was a really fascinating issue for me to work on. It involved a lot of research and I read a lot about the history of Ohio. And I actually spoke to, (laughs) I I really nerded out on this issue. I spoke to a (laughs) professor at Northwestern about this who kind of tracks these restrictive covenants or these racially restrictive covenants or discriminatory covenants because it's not all related to race. And I talked to a couple of recorders across the state of Ohio. And I mean, they were great to work with, but We have this, and we're not unique. A lot of states still do have these discriminatory covenants on property deeds. But essentially, long ago, before 1948, 1968, there was language written on the deeds of properties. And it was, quite frankly, it was repulsive and hateful language. And it just said something, and it it ranges, it's all different kinds of things. It might say a certain religion can't live in this home. Or it might say only Caucasian people can live in this home, but it's it's discriminatory. It is also, it's unenforceable. And that was a decision that was handed down by the United States Supreme Court in 1948. In that case, it's Shelley versus Kramer. And then it, it had to go a step further because just because they're unenforceable, it doesn't make them illegal because they were still being written onto property deeds even after that 1948 Supreme Court case. So in the 1968 Federal Fair Housing Act, it made writing these covenants illegal. So unfortunately, there are many, many homes. I know there's specifically 5,000, give or take, properties in just in Franklin County that have these discriminatory covenants still on the deed. And there's just this really weird gray area in the law that although they're unenforceable and they're illegal, some homeowners want them removed for their own personal reasons. I argue it's a private property rights issue. A private property owner should be able to get that taken off without having to go to court. And there, again, there was this weird gray area of how they do it. You know, do they have to hire an attorney and go to court? And what, how do we do this? How do we do it simply and and inexpensively? So um, Senator Herschel Craig kind of started this conversation in 2017 with a bill. I did work with the Reporters Association. I work with the Bar Association, Land Title Association, and many, many legislators. And we came up with a a good piece of legislation that was actually introduced as a standalone bill by Representative Haraz Ganbari and Dontavious Geralds. We just worked on finding a way that we could make this a simple enough act without putting too much burden on the recorders because they do see themselves as historians, like their sole purpose is to copy history and make sure it's accurate and legal. So all this does is it makes a process for attorneys to remove these discriminatory covenants and makes it free from civil liability. So a lot of attorneys, when they're preparing a deed for a transfer of property, will remove this language moving forward. So this is not looking back to historical deeds. And I did speak to professors and historians about that case. You know, do we want to remove these from history? You know, do we want to remove these from everything? And they said, please don't. Like, we're yeah. still tracking them. It helps us understand segregation yeah. and, and redlining and all of the terrible things that came with that whole process. And so they asked, please don't do anything with it. You can have a new deed drawn up without that language, and that would be great. And then we can still have history to learn from to learn our lessons from, of course. So again, it's a really small change that could potentially have a pretty big impact. So a homeowner could just go to an attorney and say, I want this disgusting language removed. It's unenforceable. It's illegal. And I'm allowed to do it now under Ohio law. An attorney can do it without fear of, you know, civil liability. Then they can file that new deed and problem solved. So Wyoming just passed a law very, very similar to this. And I know there are many other states that are kind of looking at ways to address this issue. So I'm really happy about it. I have to give a shout out to a couple of legislators, Senator Gavarone, Senator Blessing, Senator Lang, Senator Herschel Craig, Senator Antonio, Representative Geralds, Representative Ganbari, and then Representative Hillier, who actually wrote the language for us. So 
there were a lot of folks involved in this and I'm just really proud of this and, and glad that we can have some closure to such a, such a, I don't know, disappointing part of history, I guess. So, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of those things you're right. It may seem small in the short term, but long term, I think it's going to have big impacts and it's one step closer to hopefully finding and being more equal across all, across all different platforms. So no. one, one tiny step, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to have a huge uh, impact long term there. So really excited about that. Great news there for sure. So let's talk now a little bit about the fair school funding. This was another really important issue to Ohio Realtors. Talk to us about that and what is it going to look like moving forward? Yeah, this is such a big issue. I know they spent, I want to say over five years. So it precedes my time at Ohio Realtors. They spent five years drafting this language. I know current speaker, Bob Cup, and then past representative Patterson, he was, it was called Cup Patterson, and it was one Democrat, one Republican. They were involved in kind of drafting this over the last four or five years. Speaker, he's now Speaker Cup. So yes. he kind of tapped the shoulders of uh, Representative Callender and then Representative Sweeney, a Democrat, because Representative Patterson has since left the legislature. So they worked on this again. It is extremely complex. I've <laughs> listened to the hearings. I have looked up the acronyms. I 90% of the time have no clue what the acronyms are, <laughs> but we've been paying attention to it. We've been asking questions. Of course, we've made it clear along the way, whatever you guys decide to do, please don't raise property taxes. We want that to be very um, apparent. And of course they listen to that. But that also was a roller coaster because the House included their, it was called the Fair School Funding Plan that had already passed the House. They included that in their budget language. And then the Senate removed much of the House's language and then replaced it with their own version, which was drastically different. During the conference committee, and when I say conference committee, that is what happens when the House passes the budget. The Senate passes their budget. The Senate has to send the budget back over to the House, and then they disagree on those changes. So they wow. have to come together. I know it's a lot of work for these people. I have to a hand it lot, to them. a lot. Yes, a lot. our our officials definitely have their work cut out for them. Absolutely, absolutely. So then, at the very, very end, they uh, have this conference committee where three legislators from the Senate come over, three legislators from the House come over, and they basically just duke out the differences. And they both negotiated the details of that final school funding bill. And it was decided that the House's version which large, would largely be adopted. It's again, it's five years in the making. And it wow. would really, yeah, it would really just target making sure that each school district, especially those lower income community schools, that they're funded more fairly. As we all know, school funding was declared unconstitutional almost 25 years ago. And I know the Ohio legislature has attempted multiple times to address the school funding problem, and they just haven't quite done it. So this is a big one. And mm -hmm. it's, it's too complex to explain, but they're just using a different a mixture where they're relying less on property taxes and more on household income wealth to kind of determine the tax liability. And based on that community, what they can afford, then they may get more or less funding. So it's a big one. It's our members have been asking about it for, I mean, far before I became a staffer at Ohio Realtors. I know Scott, who's our CEO, has worked on it for a long time. He sat on a huge task force like 10 years ago to look at this. And so it's been, it's a big one in the making. And I, I think a lot of people are very pleased with the final product and they're very glad that the legislature has put so much work into this. So yeah, we'll that's, an that's an exciting one too. An exciting one to be able to finally have some movement on and some completion and be able to say, all right, we figured this one out. <laughs> that yeah. was a big one to figure out and, and move yeah. on from. So it sounds like there's a lot of uh, really positive stuff and a lot of issues that we were kind of in favor for ended up turning out in this budget. Was there anything, um, you know, that we were hoping to see that didn't happen or some things that we were hoping that would not happen that did happen? Was there any surprises from that? Yeah, there were, I mean, maybe like one disappointment, I guess, and one almost disappointment. So I'll start with the, the one disappointment was we, we were working with the governor and 
the executive office and the legislature to put in our first time homebuyer savings bill. Unfortunately, there were some concerns by the Department of Tax. And so we did finally come to a common ground with them. And we made some really solid improvements to that bill. But unfortunately, we just couldn't do it through the budget process. So we have been moving that bill as a standalone bill in both the House and the Senate. I'm not sure what the appetite is for that right now. I I think there's still life in that legislation. We're going to keep pushing for it. But we were we were really hoping to move it in the budget. And unfortunately, it just it just didn't happen. There were just some technical issues with tax that we needed to iron out. And we just ran out of time for that. But that's OK. We still have a year and a half to keep pushing for that. I'm very committed to it. I think it's a great piece of legislation. I know there are a lot of champions over there in that state house. One issue that kind of popped up that kind of scared several of us was the affordable housing issue. There was a bill introduced a few years ago by Senator Matt Huffman, who's now the Senate president, and it would essentially change how federally subsidized affordable housing is valued for tax purposes. So currently in Ohio, county auditors value certain affordable properties like Section 202 and low-income housing tax credits, and they value them based on how much rent they collect. So a lot of these properties have deed restrictions uh, that say that they can't they can't charge market rent. They have to charge, you know, 30% less or whatever it is. So they're not legally allowed to charge market rent. And so it's not fair for them to get taxed at market rent. That doesn't make much sense. So the change would then require auditors to value those properties at market rates without considering any of those those use restrictions. So it would not only increase the property tax liability, but it could put a lot of these properties into pretty severe financial distress pretty quickly. It would also, yeah, it was, it, it's interesting. We, you know, we philosophically disagree with it because we were afraid that this would disincentivize affordable housing development here in Ohio. And we don't have a ton of it. Mm-hmm. A lot of those, a lot of those developments are in rural parts of the state. You know, we're, we assert that we need more affordable housing. I mean, it's it's different from workforce housing. It's true affordable housing for uh, lower income Ohioans. But again, we testified on this and we just said, look, at a time when affordable housing is more challenging than ever, this is the wrong move to make at this time. Let's and we just said, take it out of the budget. Let's put it in the typical committee process so the public can come in and testify and offer expertise. And the Ohio Bankers League was also leading the charge on this because they hold the notes to these properties and they were pretty freaked out, of course. Right. Um, and then the affordable housing groups were also really heavily involved. So we did join a coalition to fight that. And much to our pleasant surprise, that amendment was removed. And instead, some language was put in that just says we're going to have a study committee. And Ohio Realtors did get a seat on that study committee. And that that person, yeah, it's great. It's great. That person will be appointed by the governor and we have to have a report done in a year. So nice. Yeah, we're so grateful that the legislature took concerns from all of us. I mean, there are 200 people that joined that coalition to just talk about this a little bit more. You know, this is a big change. In, in such a short period of time. And so we just wanted to talk about it and make sure that this is the right move and, you know, make sure that it wouldn't disincentivize affordable housing in Ohio. But with that said, I think the budget was truly a good package. I Nothing, nothing really got us, I guess, for lack yeah. of a better way to put it. And I think that just speaks to how much the legislature respects the real estate industry and they know that having a strong real estate industry is good for all of Ohio. And I am truly grateful for that acknowledgement from them. And I think this budget really speaks to that. So I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, it it absolutely sounds like it was positive and a success for all of our realtors and, and property owners throughout the state. And I think that it's a, you know, testament to your work as well. I mean, you you do a lot of work on all of these issues and the fact that we were listened to in the way that we were and that our outcome is something that we're proud of, I think says a lot to the work that you do too. So thank you for all the work you do for realtors and property owners across the state. And we know that this could not have happened without you. So thank you for your work that you did on this. Thank you for breaking down 
all of the the budget issues, I'm sure we could go on another 30 minutes here. <laughs> and I'm sure there's tons of stuff that we're missing and didn't get a chance to uh, talk about. But I think we spotlighted some really important issues here and things that um, our realtors and our members should be excited about as we head into 2022 and 2023. So thank you for your work on the budget. Thank you for breaking this down to all of our listeners. Um, It was a pleasure to have you on as always. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'll have to give a shout out to our members who are the ones who also, they're the ones who are in the trenches talking to legislators every day. And I just appreciate that. It makes my job a lot easier. So thank you so much, Allison, for having me on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you to our members, listeners. Thank you guys for uh, joining us as always. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time. This has been a Humble Pod production. Stay humble.